podcast. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone. A place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll free 800 610 7035. My email address is exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our main website where you can listen to the Exxon 247365, www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour is Professor Francis A. Boyle, and um, we're going to be talking to the professor who was at the University of Illinois about uh, the. Well, Professor Boyle drafted the U.S. Biological Weapon Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, which is the U.S. Domestic Implementing Legislation for Biological Weapons Convention. His books include Biowarfare and Terrorism. Now, recently, Professor Boyle said, different United States government agencies have a long history of doing allegedly defensive biological warfare research at labs in Liberia and Sierra Leone. This includes the CDC, which is now the point agency for managing Ebola spillover into the United States. Why is the Obama administration dispatching the elite 101st Airborne Division to Liberia when they have no medical training to provide medical treatment to dying Africans? How did Zaire Ebola get to West Africa from about 3,500 kilometers away from where it was first identified in 1976? Well, joining me now from the University of Illinois is Professor Francis Boyle. And, uh, Professor, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me on, Rob, and my best to your listening audience and uh, everyone up there in Canada. My mother's family is uh, French-Canadian, so always happy to speak with people up there. Well, we're happy to, that you could take time out of your busy schedule, sir, to join us. Uh, Ebola, the number one news story in Canada, the United States, and around the world. Two people contracted Ebola uh, from um, Mr. Duncan, the first person to bring Ebola into the United States from Africa. And now it seems that the entire scenario pertaining to the protection of nurses and medical staff and now the public is, is just non-existent. Where did we go wrong, sir? Well, the problem here is with the uh, CDC protocols uh, for Ebola, and what they should be applying are the SARS protocol mm -hmm. that you remember the SARS crisis you had up there in uh, Canada. Yes, sir. Secure uh, the uh, acute respiratory uh, syndrome, and it's obvious the uh, CDC protocols do not work, uh, and they're not going to work. And instead of uh, publicly coming out and saying that, the CDC is just digging in its heels and saying, well, we're going we're gonna to try to approve our uh, protocols that mm -hmm. don't work. So all this is going to do is uh, expose certainly uh, U.S. healthcare workers to this uh, uh, Ebola. And now we see this uh, one nurse uh, flu uh, from, you know, uh, Dallas, to Cleveland and right. back, exposing all those people, and she was running around in uh, Cleveland for five days. Um, so, but but you people up in Canada have experience in dealing with SARS, and you did uh, effectively deal with it. Uh, I can't say I, I followed that in detail, mm -hmm. uh, but I know uh, Canada had had a serious problem, and you dealt with it, and. That's really what we need to be doing down here in the United States. And also, since I'm of uh, French-Canadian ancestry, uh, I think the, the Canadian health ministry and minister must immediately institute the SARS protocol and not the uh, CDC Ebola protocol. Uh, they must do this uh, immediately. 
Something that we just found out today during a congressional hearing, uh, Professor Boyle, was that the nurse who flew to uh, from Dallas to Connecticut and back had called up the CDC and asked them the day before that she was she was confirmed to have Ebola if it was safe for her to travel, and the CDC gave their blessings. That is correct, because the CDC is operating off their uh, uh, regular um, Ebola protocol, which, uh, in my professional opinion, is not the correct protocol that should be applied here. It's the SARS protocol. And again, I I would encourage all uh, the public health authorities there in Canada to immediately institute the uh, SARS protocol that you did uh, effectively develop uh, to protect the uh, health of the American people and simply uh, discard the CDC protocol. And in fact, uh, I would not pay the least bit of attention at all uh, to any advice the uh, CDC is giving you. They're, you know, they're up to their eyeballs in um, covering up what's uh, going on here. Right. Uh, I have uh, documented proof that the Centers for Disease Control was doing biowarfare work for All right, the Pentagon. Perf- let's talk about this in, when I come back from this. Leone, let's talk about this when I come back from this two-minute uh, commercial break, please. Professor Boyle is our guest. Sure. We'll be back in two minutes. Don't go away. Explanation. Uh, professor Francis Boyle is my special guest this hour. He is a professor at the University of Illinois, Illinois, Chicago. I'm sorry, University of Illinois College of Law. And uh, Professor Boyle drafted the U.S. Biological Weapon Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, uh, which includes the U.S. domestic implementing legislation for the Biological Weapons Convention. His books include Bio Biowarfare and Terrorism. Uh, before we went to the uh, break, Professor, you were saying that the U.S. has a connection with with Sierra Leone when it comes to laboratories? Well, not this United States alone. I mean, uh, the uh, Fort Detrick has been over there. They do oh, biowarfare work. Tulane has been over there. They do biowarfare work. But I have documented evidence right here in front of me that the Center for Disease Control itself was doing biowarfare work for the Pentagon in Sierra Leone, ground zero for uh, this, uh, as no later than 1988, and probably a lab constructed before that. We know that the uh, Pentagon and the uh, USAID uh, constructed a BSL-4 lab, biosafety lab 4 level, uh, the highest level of containment possible, uh, over in Kenema, uh, Sierra Leone. And there they uh, engaged in all this uh, dual-use, offensive, defensive, uh, biological weapons type of work. Indeed, the uh, bio-warrior from Tulane who was involved in this, and they, they've done, they do a lot of bio-warfare work in Tulane, just like uh, up there in uh, Winnipeg in, right. in Canada they do. Uh, he announced that the work they were doing at these labs in West Africa, and there's a whole series of CDC, um, uh, 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 USAID labs over there in West Africa, was not there for either the uh, screening or treatment of the West Africans themselves, but for the sake of uh, pure science, <laughs> what you know, what type of science do you do My God. at a BSL four lab? It's it's this uh, offensive, defensive, uh, dual use uh, bio warfare work. We know for a fact that during the Reagan administration, they ordered the Center for Disease Control and American Type Culture Collection, which is a scientific institute to ship uh, 40 shipments of weapons specific biological agents to Iraq to Saddam Hussein to be used for the purpose of weaponization to be used against Iran. I have the citations to that in in my book and this was also a uh, subject of uh, 
congressional uh, hearings. So you, I have the citations in there. So CDC has been involved in biowarfare work uh, for the United States government, uh, for the Pentagon, offensive bio biowarfare work, uh, going back at least to the Reagan administration that we know of. So I'm just saying mm -hmm. the Canadian government cannot trust anything the CDC is telling them. You are going to have to uh, convene a group of uh, some of your top uh, experts. Uh, you must not use any of these biological warfare experts at uh, Winnipeg uh, or uh, 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 McMaster or anywhere else because they're up to their nose in it too. But outside independent experts, uh, uh, geneticists, biologists, medical doctors, uh, who have never done any type of biological warfare work, uh, they call it research, but it's biological warfare work, for the United States government or uh, Canada. And we know for a fact that the Canadian scientists were doing biowarfare work for the Pentagon under the Reagan administration back, back into the 1980s. So these people have to be completely uh, uh, excluded because they, they're implicated in all this. So you need to get outside independent experts who have never been involved uh, and convene uh, a, a committee and, uh, in my opinion, uh, act to protect the Canadian people now. Uh, I think uh, the first thing would be to apply the SARS protocol that, that Canada successfully developed up there. Second, if, if anyone does show up in um, uh, Canada that, that has symptoms, they should be immediately uh, transferred to a BSL-4 hospital. I don't know if you have a BSL-4 hospital in Canada. Uh, we have four of them uh, down here. Those are the only hospitals so far uh, that have been able to safely and uh, uh, effectively treat the uh, Ebola patients we have down here. And then third, uh, I think Canada uh, has to put a, 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 a do not board uh, uh, on uh, your your computers up there, uh, which you do have, uh, for anyone whose flight uh, originates from um, uh, West Africa. I'm not talking about people going in, humanitarian relief workers going in, that's fine. Uh, but even there, the, the humanitarian relief workers have to understand if they go in, they have to uh, undergo a quarantine for 42 days before they come back. And that, too, uh, is the problem with the CDC protocol. Right now, the CDC protocol is saying, well, you only have to be quarantined for 21 days, and then, then you'll be all right. The WHO said this is wrong. Our, our quarantine is 42 days. So um, those are, uh, I, I think, three steps uh, that the, the SARS protocol uh, treatment in a BSL-4 hospital and putting a hold on uh, uh, travel in uh, to Canada, that can easily be done. Your, your equivalent of the Homeland Security down here has all that travel information on their uh, computers, and they can, they can simply put a DNB, what's known as a DNB down here on it, that these people are not allowed uh, right. into the country. The screening uh, that, that you see now at five U.S. airports that's nothing more than uh, public yep. uh, hand-holding. And the truth of the matter is, Rob, in, in my opinion, what is really being done here uh, by the Obama administration, they, they know they have a total disaster on their hands here, but they are trying to manage it as a public relations matter as best as possible and keep it under control until the uh, November 4 elections, where the Democrats, Obama and his people, uh, could lose control of the uh, U.S. House, uh, sorry, the U.S. Senate. And that is why uh, I believe, you know, we're seeing the stalling and delaying and covering up and lying by uh, CDC. Uh, I believe they are getting all of their uh, talking points uh, directly out of the White House on this, and and this is exactly what happened on the um, Benghazi fiasco. Oh my gosh! Uh, yes. Over there in Benghazi, 
uh, before the run-up to the last presidential election two years ago. Uh, they knew they had a disaster there. They put out fake, false uh, talking points just to keep it uh, under control uh, until after the uh, presidential election. It was it was supposed to be very close between uh, Obama and Romney, but it turned out it was an Obama blowout. So, um, you know, that would be my advice to the uh, Canadian health authorities. There, you, you need to, you know, you need to have an emergency committee, right. uh, uh, an Ebola committee, uh, to look into this uh, immediately. And again, outside independent uh, health science experts who have never worked, uh, had done any biological warfare work uh, for the uh, United States government mm-hmm. or the Canadian government. What is amazing down here is the news media is calling in all these people who did biowarfare work for the United States government to comment on the, as their experts. And for the most part, all of them are simply discounting the dangers involved here uh, because, you know, that, that's their job. They're not, they're not going to get out there and tell the truth. And some of them have been up to their eyeballs in this type of work. So of course they're not uh, they're not going to level with the American people. You know, and it's funny because the administration keeps on talking about its transparency. By the way, uh, Professor, the the only bio lab that we were able to find here that is a level uh, BSL uh, four is in Winnipeg, and it costs right. the Canadian taxpayers one hundred and seventy five million dollars, and it's only one of fifteen in the world. I had an idea. Um, why don't we just stop the people from coming into the United States and into Canada until they have gone through a precautionary 21-day quarantine before leaving Africa. So I decided what I would do... Well, that's correct. Yeah, what I did as a good Canadian, but, but, I decided... Rob, let me yes, correct you there one point, though. You see, you are operating in good faith off the completely erroneous CDC protocol. Ah. Because the WHO put out a statement yesterday that I read, you can find on their uh, website, right. indirectly criticizing the CDC and saying, no, 21 days is not the correct period. The WHO period for a quarantine is 42 days, and that would only, even if you did a quarantine for 42 days, mm-hmm that would only pick up 98% of the cases. Wow. So everyone, the CDC is running around saying 21 days, and they know full well the WHO is saying 42 days, and they just don't care. And that's why Canada cannot rely on anything the CDC is saying. It's unreal. Uh, It it seems that there's more to this than meets the eye. I, I think that this is all a... Something to do with the upcoming elections. Uh, I I can't understand why President Obama has not come up front and taken control of the situation himself. If anything, this is doing him and his party more harm than good. Well, the truth is, uh, Rob, I think the real truth came out as to what is really going on here behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It would be a total disaster for Obama and the Democrats between now and November 4. And that's why they're lying, they're covering up, they're dissembling. Oh, uh, the meeting yesterday Obama had at, at the White House with mm-hmm. his cabinet, now, that was just a photo opportunity to, to try to convince people uh, it, it's under control. Right. When I, I think people have enough common sense to realize it's totally out of control. Professor, you and I have and, to take a quick look break. At the news media, uh, we have if to you take... look at the news media commentators, mm-hmm. They're all following. The, they're all. They have talking points from the CDC. Sure. They're just repeating what the CDC is saying. All right, Professor, stand by. I have to take a news break. We'll be right back. Great interview with a great gentleman, Professor Francis Boyle, is our guest, and we'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Next donation, uh, Professor Francis Boyle is our guest. He is a professor at the University of Illinois, Illinois College of Law. 
Uh, he drafted the U.S. Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, which is the U.S. domestic implementing legislation for the Biological Weapons Convention. His books include Biowarfare and Terrorism. And this is a question that, uh, that Professor Boyle asked. Why is the CDC not better prepared for this emergency after the United States government has spent somewhere in the area of $70 billion after the October, 20, uh, October 2001 anthrax attacks to prepare for this exact contingency? It is clear that those anthrax attacks originated from the United States government sources. My question is uh, to you, uh, Professor, since you are undoubtedly one of the leading legal minds in the United States today. When it comes to President Obama and his authority, can he actually do what he's doing in Africa using American military? Well, this is extremely dangerous, what he has done to the U.S. military forces. Um, We have no idea precisely what this Ebola is Mm -hmm. that has come out of uh, West Africa. It very well could involve a genetically modified organism that was done there at the BSL-4 facility in Kenema uh, that the CDC, and by the way, Fort Detrick, <laughs> which manufactures all of our biological weapons, uh, was, were, still are involved in. So we could be dealing here with a, a genetically modified uh, organism uh, affixed to Ebola to make it uh, even more dangerous uh, than it was. All previous uh, Ebola outbreaks have been contained soon, and the fatality rate for all of them before this, going back to when uh, Ebola was first discovered in 1976, was uh, 50%. Now, uh, finally, the WHO came clean and said the fatality rate over there is um, 70%. And it is not under control. Indeed, it is totally uh, out of control. So my concern here is that what we are dealing with is uh, a GMO'd uh, Ebola Mm -hmm. that came out of uh, Kenema and perhaps some of those other CDC labs. And Obama is sending um, uh, 4,000 U.S. military forces uh, directly in there, and we have no idea what what we're dealing with. And in addition, uh, I just sent you National uh, Public Radio announced that um, Obama says he's going to uh, mobilize uh, U.S. military reserves to send over to West Africa. I would certainly, in the strongest terms possible, um, tell the Canadian government that under no circumstances must you send uh, Canadian armed forces to West Africa. Uh, not until uh, you know we have a, a basic understanding uh, of what we are dealing with. Has this uh, Ebola been GMO'd at Kenema or any of these other uh, uh, CDC facilities? Mm-hmm. Uh, has it been weaponized by uh, Fort Detrick? Uh, I don't have uh, an answer uh, to those questions, but I do know this type of work uh, has been done. And indeed, um, I believe it's being done up there in Winnipeg. This uh, Dr. Kawaoka from the University of Wisconsin, uh, he is notorious, if you do a Google search on him, uh, he resurrected the Spanish flu virus for the Pentagon for obviously uh, weapons purposes. He has also done uh, gain-of-function uh, uh, research that is jumping trans species, uh, for example, from animals to humans, or one a- one animal to another. But the implication is quite clear uh, that that involves GMO. Uh, and he has also worked on Ebola, uh, including uh, uh, a reverse genetic system for generating the virus, which is a polite way to say weaponizing it. Um, well, 
when the um, whistle was blown on this work down here in the United States, uh, he moved it all up to Winnipeg to the um, BSL-4 uh, facility there right. uh, because uh, he only had a BSL-3 facility uh, down here at, at the University of Wisconsin. So you put together the Spanish flu virus, which he did for the Pentagon, uh, uh, these uh, uh, enhancement GMOs, uh, and uh, weaponizing Ebola, and it's all right there. So, so we know for a fact that at least uh, one uh, uh, scientist uh, was doing this type of work, first at the University of Wisconsin, and then uh, uh, the la- this report I have here is 2007, up at uh, uh, Winnipeg. And uh, I guess, you know, one could only conclude they might have been doing it over mm-hmm. there at that uh, Enema uh, facility because, again, we know that Fort Detrick was over there. Uh, and Fort Detrick does uh, offensive biological warfare work claiming uh, it, is the, it is, you know, is being then done for defensive purposes which gets back to the $70 billion. And, in fact, I just got the new figures. Here in the United States, uh, we have spent $79 billion since uh, October 11, 2001, Mm -hmm. allegedly uh, researching uh, uh, biological agents that could be a threat to the American people like Ebola, which is on the list, they've been working on Ebola since the 1980s, uh, to protect the American people from these biological agents like Ebola. Well, you can see now in the United States that absolutely nothing has been done by anyone uh, to protect the American people from Ebola. That is quite clear. So then it's clear what was going on with this $79 billion dollars uh, was to develop an offensive um, biological warfare industry, uh, which we now have in the United States. We have close to 14,000 uh, scientists doing biological warfare work. Right. We have over, uh, depending on how you count it, 300 BSL-3 labs, which are just short of BSL-4, that you could even do anthrax work in if you want. So it's clear uh, we have here in America uh, uh, an offensive biological warfare industry. Uh, I can't say I've really followed it uh, up there in Canada, but I know that they do this work in, uh, at Winnipeg at the BSL-4, and I did lecture a few years ago at uh, McMaster. I was the uh, Bertrand Russell uh, uh, peace lecturer there, and they informed me that there were bio-warriors there at McMaster, uh, that that did this type of work uh, as well. So that's what the seventy nine billion dollars was going. Um, not not protecting the health of the American people, which is now very obvious to everyone who looks down here in America. You know, I I, I watch the news and and something that has that has struck me, uh, Professor, is that here in the northern part of Africa, you have ISIS. Down in the southern part, you have Ebola. Now, with all the Americans and Canadians that have been radicalized and are over there fighting, I, I, I have a, I would hate like hell to see ISIS get a hold of the Ebola strain and actually infect Canadians and Americans who are returning back to Canada and the United States carrying this dreaded disease and using these these returning radicalized uh, fighters as walking biological weapons. Well, with all due respect, Rob, the real threat here is the United States and Canada sending their military forces into the hot zone uh, on West Africa. That's the real threat. Uh, I, you know, I don't know, uh, Ebola, you know, ISIS, uh, whatever they're doing over mm-hmm. there, they seem to be pretty busy to me. Yeah. The real threat is us sending uh, troops in there who are totally unprepared to do anything. And then, sec- second, um, 
uh, health care workers going in, uh, it does seem that um, Doctors Without Borders uh, knows what they're doing. And even there, uh, uh, I, I think several of those MSF doctors have died uh, from the Ebola. It might be nine out of 16 or something like that. Um, and that very well could be because the Ebola has been, been GMO'd. It's, it's been weaponized. Right. It's been um, made airborne. Again, I, I don't have evidence mm-hmm. uh, that that is correct, but we know the United States government does that type of work. So this fellow uh, Kawaoka at uh, Winnipeg, Wisconsin, Winnipeg is doing it. Fort Detrick has done that type of work uh, in, in Fort Detrick itself. Why do you think, then, what is your theory on why American troops are actually going to Africa if they don't know what they're doing, if they're not prepared. Why send them into harm's way? I can't understand it. Well, Rob, let me say, this has never bothered the United States uh, financial elite, power elite who runs this country uh, uh, in the past. They have sent U.S. forces into uh, Vietnam, yeah. with Agent Orange there, uh, dioxin, one of the most toxic substances uh, known to humanity, to be poisoned by dioxin, and it didn't bother them at all. Uh, likewise, uh, in, in Iraq, uh, both wars, uh, the Gulf War Syndrome, uh, where you had this uh, toxic mix of biological weapons that we had given to Saddam Hussein, right. uh, chemical weapons, uh, that even the New York Times reported yesterday were given to Saddam Hussein uh, by the United States and its uh, NATO allies, and then depleted uranium uh, munitions that the United States uh, knew full well uh, were radioactive and yes. carcinogenic. So the United States government has never had any problem in sending United States uh, armed forces into toxic, carcinogenic, uh, uh, deadly types uh, of environments uh, before. Uh, You know, I hate to say there's a book called uh, Home Front you can get uh, on Amazon.com. Rick Anderson, um, uh, Seattle uh, 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 reporter, award-winning, and I wrote a a forward to it on uh, everything that was done to, you know, U.S. soldiers in, uh, in Vietnam. Deliberately, they knew exactly what they were doing on, on Agent Orange. And likewise, in uh, both Gulf Wars, uh, the Pentagon knew full well that they were exposing uh, U.S. armed forces to all these environmental toxic uh, dangers uh, in Iraq twice in a row. So it, I know it, it sounds inhumane to you and to me, uh, but not to the uh, U.S. financial lead here and I take it to Canadian financial lead, yeah. because for the most part, it is not their children um, going into these uh, hot, hot zones. God bless the, the veterans who come back from the theaters that, that we've seen them come back from since Vietnam. We can't take care of them, right? How in the name of the good no, God? No, of course not. No, <laughs> How are we going to take care no, of, of course, the, the and, troops that, who, if by chance they contract Ebola? How are we going to take care of them? Well, you know, if you look at uh, Agent Orange and the Gulf War Syndrome, mm-hmm. certainly when U.S. Armed Forces came back, the uh, Pentagon just said that these problems don't exist. Just that's, like depleted. That's all I can say. They, didn't, they just would not recognize... Uh, it, it just take a look at yesterday's New York Times uh, on on Iraq, uh, where they did everything to lie and cover up uh, the fact that uh, U.S. soldiers were exposed to old uh, 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 chemical weapons left over from the Iraq-Iran war that we helped uh, give Saddam Hussein. So they don't really care. Um, and as for uh, coming back, well, I regret to say they very well might not be coming back. Uh, They might get quarantined over there. Um, And then, you know, if if, (laughs) the other point is, why are we sending 4,000 U.S. armed forces uh, over there when uh, there is no preventative vaccine, none, to Ebola? 
And, and indeed, they allegedly, the Pentagon allegedly has been working on a preventative vaccine for Ebola since the Reagan administration in the 1980s. And they still don't have it. And why don't they have it? Because they were never really interested in it. They were interested in, in using Ebola as a weapon. Uh, they spent billions of dollars. As I said the, the figure going back uh, uh, since just 2001 is $79 billion. Now, that's about twice what the United States government spent in constant dollars on the Manhattan Project to develop the, uh, the nuclear bomb. Yeah. Uh, so they've spent enough money here, you know, going back to Reagan. I, I, I don't have the figures on how much was spent from 1981 to, no, 2001. Uh, you know, you probably have to add another uh, $5 billion on that figure I gave you. Uh, but, but, and that's a minimum uh, figure. Uh, but they've been, they said they've been doing this ever since then. Of course, they haven't because that's, that's not what they're really up to. So we don't have uh, an Ebola vaccine because they're not interested. It's not, the newest media, the CDC, is trying to say, well, well you didn't give us enough money or you cut back our funds. Well, that's ridiculous. Last year alone, the CDC, uh, well, all biowarfare uh, uh, programs in America got about $6.9 billion. So they've had more than enough money for more than enough years. All right, stand by, uh, Professor. We've got to take our vaccine. final break. We'll be back shortly. Don't go away. Explanation of Professor Francis Boyle is our very special guest. He is a professor at the University of Illinois College of Law. And uh, this professor is the gentleman who drafted the U.S. Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, which is the U.S. domestic implementing legislation for the Biological Weapons Convention. And his books include Biowarfare and Terrorism. First of all, Professor Boyle, I want to thank you ever so much, sir, for not only coming on the show tonight, but all the great work that you do. I've had a look at the, your, your biography and the work that you're doing. Uh, God bless you. Keep the great work up, and thank you. Well, thanks. And, you know, being of uh, French-Canadian uh, ancestry, I'm uh, always happy to uh, help out up there. You know, my family comes from uh, Montreal, yeah. so my mother's family. Well, we've got about three minutes before we have to say so long, Professor. Is it too late to turn everything around? Is there a sinister plot that is at hand. I, I remember having guests on the show telling me that there are that there are like internment camps that have been constructed at various locations, remote locations throughout the United States. I've had people come on who work in industry saying that their industries were hired by the U.S. government to make hundreds of thousands of coffins. Now, at the time, I thought... Well, I don't know about the coffins, yeah. but uh, I do know the uh, internment camps are there, right? We... Uh, we worked on that back in the uh, 1980s with the uh, sanctuary movement, and uh, I did have uh, a minister. He went down and checked them out. Now, wow. I don't know anything about coffins. Yeah. I'm not saying this is a, a sinister plot, but what I, do, what I would say is that uh, it is not too late for Canada because right now you do not have any Ebola case that we know about. That's right. And that's why uh, I think the Canadian health authorities have to have an emergency meeting without anyone who's done any biological warfare work at all for the United States or uh, uh, Canada uh, and uh, figure out what is the strategy here. And in, at a minimum, it's got to be that SARS protocol that you uh, uh, develop. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, uh, treatment. Uh, should be at a BSL-4 facility, or I'm not a hospital. I don't know if you've got a BSL-4 hospital up there. If not, then um, invite in uh, Doctors Without Borders, because they seem to know what they're doing. Indeed, it's so bad down here in the United States that the CDC has said they're inviting in Doctors Without Borders to set up an operation Mm -hmm. operations in Dallas. Yeah. Now think about that for a minute. 
see the, uh, Doctors Without Borders goes all around to third world countries and treats people. And effectively, CDC is admitting we can't do it. We're going to have to import them and stick them in Dallas to do it. So, uh, and then third, you, you have everyone's itinerary there on your homeland security uh, computers. And you're just going to have to deny boarding yeah. uh, to anyone coming from um, West Africa or who has an itinerary from West Africa. They're easily done with, with the programming flip of the switch uh, uh, to, to keep these people out. And indeed, on this point, uh, one of the top bio-warfare warriors here in the United States, uh, who's up to his uh, eyeballs in Ebola, a fellow named Giesbert, who works with Fort Detrick, wow. uh, and also down at uh, Galveston that, that does all sorts of hideous biological warfare research, he said the exact same thing independently of me. Uh, he said, you know, if you want to keep the Ebola out of the country, you're going to have to put a stop on the travel. Professor, so that would be my advice to the Canadian government. Professor, once again, thank you very much, sir, for coming on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. If there's anything we can do for you, getting anything out to the international listeners, let me know. We'll get you right on. Take care of yourself, sir, and thank you once again. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Professor Francis Boyle has been my guest. I'll be back on the other side of the news. Don't go away. Mm-hmm.